Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're so glad that you're here. We'll go ahead and start our service with our reader. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you would join with me as we read Psalm 91, verses 1 through 13 responsively. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. Christ promised us that whenever two or more are gathered in his name, he is present with us, and we worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible tells us, and we all know from our own lives, that the world doesn't work the way that it is supposed to. It is broken. And this brokenness affects our relationship with God and with each other. Unfortunately, we are unable to fix what is broken because we ourselves are broken. We call this brokenness sin. And as the Bible says, if we claim that we're free from sin, we're only fooling ourselves. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, God will forgive us. Once forgiven, our relationship with God is repaired and the basis for repairing our relationships with each other is established. Let us spend a few moments now together and confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Father in heaven, we are broken and need your help. We ask you to forgive whatever sins we have committed. Guide us so that your forgiveness overcomes our broken lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is merciful, and so I say to you this day that your sins have been forgiven. To make sure that you know your sins are forgiven, God's own Son, Jesus Christ, gave up his life on the cross for you. So let go of the burdens that are weighing you down and give them to Jesus and celebrate this new opportunity that God has given you. Amen. Please join with me in our prayer of the day. O oh God, your greatest desire is that we would turn away from our sin and turn to you. During this time of Lent, have mercy on us in our weakness. For we came from dust, and to dust we shall return. Instead, remember your son's sacrifice on the cross so that we can live in your light and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, and you have conquered it and settled there, put some of the first produce from each crop you harvest into a basket and bring it to the designated place of worship the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Go to the priest in charge at that time and say to him, With this gift I acknowledge to the Lord your God that I have entered the land he swore to our ancestors he would give us. The priest will then take the basket from your hand and set it before the altar of the Lord your God. You must then say in the presence of the Lord your God, My ancestor Jacob was a wandering Arminian who went to live as a foreigner in Egypt. His family arrived few in number, but in Egypt they became a large and mighty nation. 
When the Egyptians oppressed and humiliated us by making us their slaves, we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. He heard our cries and saw our hardship, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and powerful arm, with overwhelming terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land flowing with milk and honey. And now, O Lord, I have brought you the first portion of the harvest you have given me from the ground. Then place the produce before the Lord your God and bow to the ground in worship before him. Afterward, you may go and celebrate because all of the good things the Lord your God has given to you in your household. Remember to include the Levites and the foreigners living among you in this celebration. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading today comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 8b through 13. In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord, who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Word of God, word of life. We're going to read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in deeper water and let the nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and I haven't caught anything, but you say so, so I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, for now you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So what always jumped out at me from this this passage is the, the focus on fish. I mean, you think about it, the Fish, the imagery of fish, has had a huge impact on church throughout its history. When the early church was facing ruthless persecution by Nero, they would draw a fish in the dirt to identify themselves as Christians. And then in the U.S., especially I remember this as a kid, you would see an outline of a fish or a bumper sticker on the back of a car, And as a kid, I didn't correlate that this meant that that person was a Christian. I thought this person really liked to fish. (laughs) So they put it back, put it on their car. But that wasn't correct, of course. It was a, it was a imagery of identification of them as Christians, just like it was back in the first century. So in this gospel reading today, We're going to see Simon Peter exhibit three important characteristics as a response to what Jesus is calling him to do. He's showing obedience, self-awareness, and trust in Jesus. 
And also, I want, just as a sidebar, I want to, um, if you're not like super familiar with the Bible, you're going to hear Simon Peter, Peter, Simon. Those are all the same people. So whenever you hear that, just know that we're talking about one, one person. So when we see that Simon Peter showed obedience, he did it when it wasn't easy. Because in the story, he had just came in from fishing all night long, because that was the right time to fish on the Sea of Galilee, was at night, not during the daytime. And so he had cleaned all his, his nets. He was probably really tired and probably a little grumpy because they hadn't caught anything all night, so that meant no money for their families for that day. And then here comes Jesus, and Jesus, what does Jesus ask him to do? He says, cast out your nets. And I don't think it would have been um, unreasonable for Peter to come back to, to Jesus and said, come back tonight when, when, it's, when it's the right time to fish, and you can join us then. But that's not what Peter did, was it? He obeys, and then the miraculous happens. Second, Peter shows an incredible self-awareness from this unexpected miracle. He realized he was in the presence of God. If we look back to verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell on his knees, and he said to Jesus, Go away from me. I am a sinful man. His feelings of unworthiness was very similar to what Isaiah's was, if we look back at the Old Testament, when God called Isaiah to follow him. In Isaiah 6, 5, it says, and this is, this is Isaiah speaking, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among people with filthy lips, yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. And after that feeling of unworthiness, Peter showed a tremendous amount of trust in Jesus. There was a cost for him to follow Jesus. He left his profession and his family. So if you look at fishermen back in that first century, they were often in business with friends or family because the barrier to get into that profession was too great to do it alone. So it was often a group, a family of friends, that owned the boat and ran the business. And so for Peter to leave and follow Jesus along with James and John, that was a really big deal. It was a monumental sacrifice, not for just for them, but also for their family, because if you look at the first century family unit, it was much different than it is today. They lived more in a communal relationship, sharing everything they had. So if the breadwinners of the family with the fishermen decided to leave, that is a big burden. I don't know if that's a good word, but that's a big stress on the family. It was a radical commitment for them that required a tremendous amount of trust. Peter recognized, though, Jesus' authority and identity, and he recognized his own sinfulness in, pres in the presence of the Holy One and trusted him enough to leave it all behind and follow him. So Jesus, he got Peter's attention with fish, but what is really the most important part in this story is what Jesus called Peter to do, to follow him and share the good news to others so that they might do the same. So we may not be professional fishermen. I don't know, there might be a, a professional fisherman here at Word of Life, but we're called the same way that these fishermen are. It's no different. Jesus is calling each one of us to cast our net, to be obedient to his call on our lives, and to trust in him. And most likely, at times, this following of Jesus will come at some type of cost. 
It might be relationship-wise, a reversal of priorities, a reordering of commitments, accepting and doing what is uncomfortable for us. Or you never know, it might even be a new career. So what, what keeps us from casting our net in our lives? I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but one, one reason might be that word discipleship. I mean, it s- sometimes brings up more questions and answers on what we're supposed to do. We, we always ask ourselves, am I capable of being a disciple? disciple and and then what do i do to be a disciple do i go up to the first random stranger i see and give them the jesus elevator pitch (laughs) it might be but let's look at back at peter's story god met peter exactly where he was at he met him at work and when he called peter to follow him and fish for people what he first said was follow him. Jesus was first going to show him what to do. And so we can be assured that we, we can follow Jesus first, and Jesus will show us that we're not on our own either. But when we accept this call to be a disciple, to follow Jesus, we can have the same doubts and worthy and feelings of if we are worthy as Peter did. Our sin distorts our view of what, of how God sees us. We can say to ourselves, well, I did this, and whatever it is, fill in the blank. So this disqualifies me from making an impact in the kingdom from God, for God. But Jesus still says, despite that, come follow me. We might say, like, Peter, go away from me, God, for I'm sinful. But Jesus is telling us, I took care of that on the cross. Come follow me. Or we may not think we're important enough. But Jesus tells us, look at who my disciples were. He called fishermen, who were like the peasants of the society in the first century. He called a tax collector. He didn't go to the synagogues to find the best and brightest students to be disciples. In this passage, he called fishermen. So then we may think, where am I called to be a disciple? And that's a big question, right? The first thing that we need to do when we ask ourselves that question is really go to God in prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to show us where he's calling us. To just be the light of Jesus to someone else's life. But even our simplest of actions to share the good news of Jesus have a huge impact And that was the case with Tim Tebow. So I have to admit, I'm a huge football fan. And last weekend, um, I watched the best of last season's games on the NFL Network, (laughs) even though I knew the outcomes of every one of the games. (laughs) But back to Tim Tebow, you might remember him. He played in the NFL for a while. but also was the Florida quarterback for the, for the Gators in the 2009 season. And so um, before that game, he wrote John 3.16 on his eye black, which you can tell if you don't know what that is, that's the, the smudgy stuff that goes underneath their eyes. And what was most impressive about um, Tim Tebow was not his athletic ability in this game. And it was really good. Um, I'll I'll give you the stats here. He completed 31 out of 35 passes for 482 yards and three touchdowns, but accounted for 533 yards of total offense and four 
touchdowns, which was a championship bowl series record. What, but, so that wasn't the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing is what you see under his eyes. And so we're gonna watch a video, if I know how to make this work, of um, what happened after this game. Honestly, after that, I didn't re even really think about it. I just went out there and tried to win the championship game. We were blessed to win, and two days later, I was at Ballyhoo Restaurant in Gainesville, Florida with me, my mom, my dad, my aunt, and um, Coach Meyer. And Coach Meyer gets a call, and he's like, uh-huh, 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 all right, bye. And I was like, who is that? He said, that was Steve McLean. Here is our PR guy at Florida. I said, what do you have to say? He said, did you know that during that game, 94 million people Googled John 3.16? And honestly, my first thought was, how the heck do 94 million people not know John 3.16? <laughs> Hashtag Sunday school, it's like the first thing you hear, you know? But I was just sitting in Ballyhoo Restaurant, just so humbled at how big the God is that we serve and how he wants to do amazing things in us and through us. And when we just step out and show a little faith or a little courage or we just decide, hey, it's okay to be a little bit different than everybody else, what God can do in our lives. And All right, so, you know, it wasn't Tim Tebow telling everybody to look that up. That was God through the Holy Spirit. Just showing people the gospel in 25 words. Because John 3.16, it is the gospel in 25 words. So we might not be Tim Tebow and be on television. We may never be on national TV, but we do have opportunities all around us on any given day. But we need to go to God in prayer and ask him to reveal where you should cast your net. He'll show you people in your own community or in your own family who are looking for what Jesus offers, but looking for it in different places. He might reveal just a simple action, like Tim Tebow, but that might have a huge kingdom impact. Or he might give you a call that is life-changing. Whatever it is, let's be like Peter and be obedient, aware of God's presence, and trust him enough to follow him and cast our nets. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are with us when we are reaching out to others to share your gospel and your love. Help us to, to just reach out with boldness, God. to love others, to let that love, even if there's no words, Lord, let that love show your light and bring others to you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we begin our Lenten journey, bring to us a new understanding of what you went through on your journey to the cross. Draw us closer to you and deepen our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are reaching out to others with the good news, including missionaries in foreign countries. Guide our outreach team and show us how we can best reach out to those in the Fairfield community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
We pray for those who are feeling lonely or isolated this winter season. Fill them with your peace and help us to find ways to reach out to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for an end to the fighting in Ukraine. Give comfort to all those who are affected by the war and encourage everyone who is helping to meet the physical, spiritual, and emotional needs of those who have been displaced. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are in need of healing for their physical bodies, mind, or emotions. As our great physician, touch them with your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us faithful this week in serving you by serving one another. Lord, in your mercy, amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you created us in your image. When we fell, your son came to lift us up. In this meal, we not only remember what Jesus did for us, but through faith, we receive the forgiveness he promises to us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Now let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Please join with me in our closing prayer. Lord, we pray that our time here will bless and guide us in the week to come. Plant your word deep in our hearts so that it will be a path before us, leading us to walk in your way so that we are a blessing to those around us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.